Hi, everybody. Thank you very much for connecting with us with the uh, international uh, channel of Asamblea Nacional Catalana today for this uh, interesting and in-depth debate about uh, something that is probably not, not well known internationally, which is the historic repression of uh, Catalan presidents. Uh, today, today, well, in, on, on the 14th of October, we remembered uh, the, 80, the 80th, uh, 8 zero, 80th anniversary of the assassination of uh, President Luis Companys of Catalonia by the uh, Spanish police, by the Spanish military police, by a firing squad ordered by uh, the Franco judiciary system. Uh, and today, also on the 16th of October, we are uh, remembering the uh, imprisonment of two of the Catalan uh, political leaders, the, world, the, the best known Catalan political leaders, Jordi Sánchez and Jordi Cuchart, three years ago in 2017, also decided by the Spanish judiciary. So today we, we will try and see whether this uh, repression against Catalan presidents, against uh, Catalan uh, political leaders is uh, just uh, an, an, a historical curiosity or is something that's a, a historical constant that's going on and will still be going on for quite some sure. time. So and today to discuss, to, to have uh, some words on this, we've got a, a fantastic and incredible panel. I'm really Really happy to have you all of three, you three here. Uh, first of all, we've got well the the last of a, of a very long political session leader. or series of uh, ousted presidents of Catalonia. Uh, it's uh, President Kim Torra y Pla. He is uh, the number one hundred and thirty-one president of the Generalitat de Catalunya. That's the government of Catalonia. Uh, who is also a lawyer, a journalist, publisher, among many other things. And uh, last but not least, he was ousted by the Spanish uh, judiciary system, uh, what, two weeks ago, three weeks ago. And, uh, and we are really, really happy to have, to have him with, uh, with us today. Uh, also, we've got um, Professor Thomas S. Harrington, and he's talking to us from uh, Connecticut, from Hartford, Connecticut. A professor of Hispanic Studies at the Trinity College in the USA, in the United States. Uh, he specialized in Iberian cultures and literatures and Iberian diasporas in the Americas with a focus on the Catalan diaspora. He's also author of the monograph, Public Intellectuals and Nation Building in the Iberian Pe Peninsula, and The Alchemy of Identity, and uh, especially very related with Catalonia in this case, and we have it here, A Citizen's Democracy in Authoritarian Times, a US view on the Catalan drive for independence. And uh, finally, we've got Joana Pujol, who's a member of the Catalan National Assembly, uh, the member of the general board of the Catalan National Assembly, and coordinator of the International Action Committee of the organization. Uh, besides being an activist, which is obvious, uh, she's currently based in London and holds a Master of Science in Contemporary History for the University of Barcelona. So we got here the, uh, the fantastic triangle from Barcelona, uh, President Torra, from Hartford, Connecticut, uh, Dr. Thomas Harrington, and from London, uh, Joana Pujol. And I'm from the Assemblea headquarters, from the Assemblea headquarters in Barcelona. So thank you very much to the three of us uh, for being here with us. And uh, we'll get started with uh, a question, obviously, for, for President Torra. Uh, President Kim Torra, I hope you are hearing us uh, loud and clear. Very clear, thank you. Great. So, um, well, uh, as I started saying, you, you have just been ousted by the Spanish judiciary. Uh, actually, uh, if you care to comment, because you, uh, you, you, you put up uh, some sign uh, saying that you wanted liberty, that you wanted freedom of expression. Uh, apparently, that's, a, that's an enough reason to, to get you ousted uh, from the presidency in Spain. So do you think this is 
uh, being ousted uh, for a president. Do you think this is something that's merely anecdotal or on the contrary, uh, can, we, can we start talking about a historical constant? Well, thank you very much. First of all, uh, thank you, Adria Alzina, for uh, this invitation and to the Catalan National Assembly for giving me this opportunity to, to share this, this, this evening together with uh, Professor Harrington and, and Joana Pujol. Thank you very much. Yes, well, in fact, uh, this is not uh, just uh, merely an anecdote uh, because Spain has systematically and continuously persecuted uh, the presidents of, of Catalonia. There are uh, numerous and various examples from the past. And well, after all, you've said that just uh, now, we are commemorating these, these days, the assassination of President Kumpanj 80 years ago. But if we see the last uh, series of uh, presidents of Catalonia, 10 of the last 12 presidents have been persecuted. And the last three presidents of the Generalitat of Catalonia, the last three democratically elected Catalan presidents of uh, our country have been disqualified or dismissed for defending our right of self-determination, our civil rights, including the right of uh, free of expression. So, uh, well, if, was, if it would have been only one case, uh, we could uh, talk about, uh, okay, there's uh, an example or just uh, something that has happened at, uh, once. But uh, 10 of the last 12 presidents the last three uh, presidents of, of Catalonia, there's, uh, let's say, uh, a, series, uh, a series of uh, persecuting. And, and we are clearly facing, in that sense, uh, an ideological and political persecution. And, and I want to say it clearly. Uh, it's something that, for instance, for, for uh, Professor uh, Harrington could, could be unbelievable. And for uh, many of you foreigners that uh, in the heart of Europe today, nowadays, uh, theological and political persecution, presidents of Catalonia say, uh, or uh, mayors of uh, many cities of Catalonia or other uh, political members of, uh, the, let's say, the, the administration of, of Catalonia are being persecuted nowadays. And you see that uh, the, the, the former president of Catalonia, President Puigdemont, is in exile, and uh, Vice President Oriol Junqueras, among others, is in, is in prison. So it's important to see that uh, what is happening in, in Europe, uh, we usually we have the tendency to see that, okay, in the, in the east of Europe uh, is happening something that, uh, well, is not exactly what uh, the Europeans are according with the, with the European values. But we have to, to see also, and we have to focus our, our vision in the, in the East as, as well. It's not only Turkey or uh, other uh, countries in, in, the, in the East, it's also in, in the West. In the, in the case of the presence of the Jaintat, uh, we have also to remember that uh, during the reign of the current monarch, uh, Felipe VI, Philip the, the VI, uh, is the last of, uh, let's say, uh, the dynasty, the Bourbons uh, dynasty, who always uh, have been so detrimental for Catalonia uh, during the, the, the reign of uh, former uh, Bourbon kings uh, happened exactly the same with the current uh, king. But it's, it's important to, to see that uh, just the last uh, six years during the, the, the reign of uh, uh, Philip uh, VI, the three presidents, the last three presidents of the Generalitat uh, of, of Catalonia uh, have been uh, dismissed from their charges. It's, it's uh, something uh, that has happened uh, here now in, in Europe. 
And uh, on the contrary, we, we have to see as well that uh, the father of the current king uh, has moved to, the, to a Gulf state, which unsurprisingly does not have an extradition treaty with Spain. So uh, there's uh, a, a very serious and cast adapt on the nature of the Spanish democratic system that uh, emerged directly from the Franco regime. I think that uh, it's not understandable what, what is happening in Spain if we don't put the attention or we don't, don't see what happened during what has been named as the transition of uh, Spain, uh, la transition, la transition. Uh, contrary with uh, what uh, the Portuguese did, that they uh, really uh, broke with the past, the transition, the famous transition in, in Spain was only just a moving from uh, the uh, dictatorship from a, a former, a formal, sorry, a formal democratic uh, state. But uh, there are many, many, many uh, things that still remain untouchable in, in the Spanish state. So uh, I think that this is very important in order to, to understand what has happened with the last three presidents of Catalonia. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. President Torra. Um, it's, it's important to note that Catalonia at the time does not have an acting president. It, it, it does have a, a, a vice president who is, who is acting as president, but uh, Catalonia will not have a president until at least February when uh, new elections will be, will be, will be held. Uh, so as uh, President Torra was saying, probably being president of Catalonia is, is one of those uh, dangerous jobs in, in Catalonia and has been for some, for some time. And I, I want to I uh, open the floor um, to uh, Dr. Thomas Harrington, because you, you can also uh, provide us with a, with a historical point of view here. But I, I, I would like to, to quote you on, on something that you said on your, on your book, again, a serie, uh, uh, it's uh, called A Citizen's Demo Democracy in Authoritarian Times, in which you actually talk about uh, Spain and Catalonia. And, and you said that, and I quote, uh, uh, everyone should thank the Catalan people for their refusal to back down in the face of intimidation and its ability to force the authoritarians to show who they really are and have, in fact, always been. So when I was reading this, 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 this paragraph, this, this sentence, uh, it struck me uh, a bit, uh, uh, well, who, who are you? Uh, labeling or who are you calling this this day? Uh, uh, I'm sorry if I'm if I'm being too uh, concise here, but but what's what's your point here? Are you calling the entire uh, Spanish state authoritarians? Uh, who is who is this day that you that you talk about? Professor uh, Harrington, I, I believe the, we've lost you for really a sec. Isn't. Who gets the ability? Yeah, uh, yeah we, am I back? You're back. You're back. We're hearing you. Okay. You now. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah, I, I, I think you're touching on, and I was trying to articulate perhaps in, in an unclear way, that what really is important in a lot of cases in national identities and in nations is the ability to name oneself, the ability to say, I am this, and that you cannot tell me who I am. Uh, when I start to talk about nationalisms within the Iberian Peninsula with my students, I always start with Nebrija's, the prologue to Nebrija's grammar of 1492, which I think says in very short and, and concise terms that the Castilian National Project, which was one of the first national projects really in Europe to consolidate itself around the idea of one nation, one language. In that prologue, it makes very clear that a, the Castilian language is linked to God, and B, that those that do not speak it at the same time are somehow barbarian and less deserving than others. And if we can speak about a hard drive, uh, cultural hard drives, if you want to use that, that, that metaphor, I think it's very important to think that there's a Castilian hard drive that says somehow, some way, we... Be 
We're losing you again. Let's see if we can. Uh, and I think we're too fast in the in the Pardon yeah, me? No, we we lost you there for a second, but you're okay. you're back, so it's fine. Just go on. I think what's <laughs> so fascinating in the Catalan case, and obviously the Basque case as well, and the Galician case in a very different way, is the refusal to be named by the center, the refusal for the center to 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 acquiesce to the idea that I will be who you want me to be, uh, and I think it's rather amazing that after 500 years of attempts to make Catalans, Basques, and Galicians in different measures something they, that the center wants them to be, there's a continual fight to say, no, we are going to be who we want to be. Now that's obviously a struggle. It's obviously imperfect, but that's what I was trying to get at with that. And I think what's so interesting is the proclivity in the case of the Spanish state to recur very easily to violence when that resistance is seen before them. And I think it has to do with the very jihadist Sorry again, you took a, you took a, a dip in there again. Uh, let's see if we get if we can hear you back. Yeah, Professor Harrington. Can you back? back? Yes, I can hear you. Yes? Yeah, all right. I, you're back. You're back. You're I'm back. sorry for the problems. I wish I knew where they were, were coming from. <laughs> it's all right. Um, you're, you're, you're speaking from far away, so it, it only makes sense. Yeah. <laughs> so I think uh, we sometimes don't think how important language and the ability to control one's naming of the self really is. So, so that's a bit of uh, uh, it, it, it. It brings a, a bit of um, of uh, 1984 there. Oh, uh, the idea that we, we start from Nebrija and uh, Castilian Spanish is the language of God, and and the ability to name things and the ability to use language uh, as a as a national tool as well. Um, I want to uh, I want to hear uh, Joana Pujol now. Uh, as a representative of of, uh, of civil of civil societies uh, political movements uh, such as the Catalan uh, National Assembly, uh, well, we know that uh, besides uh, being be, besides the fact that, of, that being president of Catalonia is a is a dangerous job, uh, we're starting to learn also that being an activist, a political activist in Catalonia, is also a dangerous job or a dangerous activity to 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 have. So. At this point, uh, correct me if, if, if you may, but uh, we've got about 2,850 Catalan representatives and activists who have been persecuted since uh, 2017 by the Spanish authorities. Uh, well, we know that suffering repression is a traumatic process and, and, and obviously yeah, negative implications to, in many aspects as a social, personal, economic and political level, politically, individually. Uh, but I, I, at the same time though, uh, and taking into consideration other examples of uh, countries like Slovenia or, or the Baltics that ultimately succeeded uh, in their national aspirations, we also can see repression as a, as a must. Some some say there must be repression in order to to move forward. So, um, uh, do you do you think the Catalan pro independence movement needs to, to change its approach in relation to, to repression, or uh, what, what? Where do you think that the Catalan uh, movement is right now, and what and what what are you going to do in the in the coming months? What is your plan? Well, good evening, everyone, and thanks, Adria, for the question. Let me start with saying that I'm very honored to be here today to talk about President Companch. Actually, six years ago, I was working as a guide in the castle of Montjuic, precisely, in Barcelona, the place where the Catalan President Luis Companch was assassinated by the Spanish regime on the morning of the 15th of October, 1940. And one day we received a very special guest from Mexico. It was the great grandson of President Cumpanch, who came to Barcelona for the first time to learn more about the political history of his ancestor. 
And we spent some minutes in the dungeons together, looking at the graffiti on the wall, which were the last messages written by the prisoners who spent their final hours in that horrible place. We walked together across the castle grounds, stopping at St. Elena's mood, where I had to explain that shamefully, every 18th of July, this was the place where the fascists celebrated their religious mass, commemorating the start of the Spanish Civil War. We finally arrived at Santa Eulalia's mood, and there we could see from afar the wall against which President Companch was executed. So the assassination of President Companch must be understood as another episode of the series of actions taking, take, taken against Catalan symbols, culture, and people by those who see them as a threat to the very existence of Spain. So repression of all sorts, from Spanish military, military police, and tribunals, has been one of the core issues in the history of Catalonia since the creation of the Spanish Inquisition in the 15th century. While Catalanophobia and repression have been endemic in the Spanish regime since then, there have been key periods, we can say, that it has increased exponentially. For example, after the War of Independence in the 17th century, and again, after the fall of Barcelona in 1714 and more recently, after the Spanish Civil War in 1939 and the implementation of the fascist Franco regime, which lasted for 40 years, whereby Catalan society and culture were subdued by Spain, the consequences of which we still feel today. It is in this context that President Companch was murdered in 1940. So after Franco's dictatorship, and especially during the 80s and the 90s, when the Catalan for independence movement was weaker and didn't have mass support like in recent times, Spain already used violence and repression to try to stop it. The victims at this time suffered the indifference of an important part of Catalan society. After the 92 Olympic Games in Barcelona, the Spanish regime arrested more than 50 people, some of whom suffered torture, fact that has been proven by the, by the European Court of Human Rights in Strasbourg. The independence referendum of the 1st of October 2017 caused one of the most important waves of mass repression we have ever seen in Catalonia. This was huge because, as was said before, we are talking about more than 2,800 people being persecuted. So repression clearly shows us the authoritarian nature of the Spanish regime, which will never allow a democratic solution for Catalonia. Spain has always used violence against not only the pro-independence movement, but against any popular movement that could question the reason of the state and its borders. It is also important to underline that it not only affected ele elected representatives like President Tora, but also ordinary people who took part in various protests and demonstrations over the past three years. A clear example are the protests that took place one year ago this week when the verdict against the Catalan political prisoners was announced and thousands of young activists occupied the streets of Barcelona for several weeks. In just one week of protests, we saw more than 200 people arrested, over 600 people injured, including 17 journalists and four people who were blinded from, from, the, from the impact of the police rubber bullets. We must also remember Dani Gallardo, a young activist who participated in a demonstration in Madrid to protest against the trial sentences one year ago today, who has been in jail since then. And not just through imprisonment and detention, repression has also shown itself in the censoring of musical lyrics, the shutting down of websites, or as we saw on the referendum day, massive full-scale direct violence against thousands of voters. So uh, answering your question, it is true that repression works. That is why states use repression to protect their interests. And Spain is one of the world clearest examples. So even when repression harms their international reputation, it is still worth it to them because the timid international reaction from the powers that be is better than allowing a democratic solution for Catalonia, which would imply the dissolution of Spain as we know it. So for Spain, the incentives in using repression outweighs the cons. This point is especially important because we must understand Catalonia 
is not Slovenia or the Baltic states. So there isn't an agenda in the European Union or the US to dissolve the Soviet Union or Yugoslavia and have the new independent states. In our case, the European Union and the US have sided with Spain and hence why it's so important to combine both civil and institutional disobedience in a combined roadmap if we ever want the international community to intervene. On the Catalan side, historically, from Pumpan's times to nowadays, there has been a push to be on the right side of history and hoping this will be enough to win, rather than assuming the authoritarian repressive nature of the Spanish regime. So yes, again, answering the question, we need to change our approach and overcome this repression by civil and institutional disobedience, which of course means also assuming there will be costs if we are ever if we are able to be independent and live in a fully democratic country. So it is also true that repression has shown us a couple of things. First, as we saw in October 2017, that when we push forward with a combination of institutional and social alignment, we can overcome repression and bring victory to within our grasp. And second, it confirms once more the authoritarian characteristic of the Spanish regime and the impossibility of a negotiated solution. So the learning acquired as a movement is huge. Now we know that the Spanish state won't hesitate to use violence against the Catalan population. And we will have to face that. But we are sure now that we have a young generation of activists that are not afraid anymore. The generation who occupied the Barcelona airport and the streets across Catalonia one year ago is an example. This young generation is not going to tolerate further humiliation or resignation. So we can say morning time is over now. The time when we expected a fair trial and we still thought that political negotiation would be possible, this time is over. The only way for Catalonia to achieve independence will be by doing so unilaterally. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Joana Pujol. Uh, you definitely are speaking as an activist and you are definitely passionate about it, which uh, we uh, no doubt uh, thank you about. Th th thank you for it. Um, and, and you were talking about uh, a, a message that the Spanish state has been has sort of sent to the, to the Catalan people. So I, I want to get, get back to, to President Torra here. And, uh, and, 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 and ask you, uh, yeah, President Torra, about this. If you believe uh, or you feel like uh, you've been used uh, somehow uh, to, uh, by the Spanish state to send a message. Uh, and if so, what, what this message would be? Uh, and, 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 and why is, the, Catalan, why is the, the Spanish state acting this way? And uh, probably also what, 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 what historical lessons can the Catalan people uh, learn from this when, when it comes to its struggle for self-determination? Yes, well, uh, now uh, Joana Pujol was, was, was talking about the, the, the days three years ago when the referendum of Catalonia was, uh, was the, the, the new around the world. But, uh, well, a, a more than 90 years ago, the new around the world was uh, the proclamation of the Catalonian Republic in Barcelona in the year, uh, just because the, the 14th of April of the year uh, 1931, when President Macià proclaimed the, the Republic of Catalonia. And, and I want to remember that because this proclamation was also an, uh, an act of uh, disobedience and uh, a decision that uh, President Macià took uh, uh, in a way that uh, nowadays we, we, we used to say uh, an, 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 unilateral, an unilateral way. Uh, and I think that is important. The, the two main uh, acts of uh, civil disobedience in Catalonia uh, contemporary in talking, and, and the two acts that, that, that really won were uh, acts uh, that were taken uh, in an unilateral way 
by President Masia and by President Puigdemont. I think that is important. And what, what happened, uh, as, as uh, Joana Pujol uh, has said uh, before, what, what happened after uh, the proclamation of the Republic of Catalonia, the 27th of October, three years ago? Well, the message uh, that Spain sent to us was, was clear. Under any circumstances, any, uh, and any, uh, any circumstances, uh, we are not going to achieve you Catalans uh, through democratic uh, means uh, to decide uh, your own future politically. I think that uh, that w that was clear. So, uh, if you want to try to do in in the way you want to 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 try to do, uh, anyway, there's there's a wall, the, the Spanish wall. Uh, in front of you, so uh, there's no possibility to 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 go in, in the way you you want. And, and I want to remember that always the the Catalanist movement and and now the independentist movement is a democratic and peaceful movement. But obviously, it doesn't mean that uh, we are not going to use the main powerful uh, tool that, that, we that we have in front of us, that is the civil disobedience. I think that um, I agree with, with uh, Joanna and, and, and what uh, others are, are saying, that uh, the only way to really, to really uh, make uh, real our, our dreams is using uh, the only thing that, that we have, that is ourselves, uh, literally ourselves, <laughs> the people of Catalonia. No? Uh, and, and I remember one of the famous phrases of President Compagni that uh, he said uh, something like this. Uh, probably I was, I'm, I'm going to be wrong in, in, in the translation, but he said that uh, uh, all the novel causes in, in the world, they, they have their uh, defensors, but uh, the Catalan cows only have the Catalans, uh, with the exception of Professor Harrington and, and other, uh, and other uh, friends of Catalonia, of course, but uh, I think that it's true. Uh, the independence of Catalonia always uh, will depend on the Catalans. And, you know, the, the, the aim and the commitment that uh, we put in that if we want to become independent, well, there are uh, paths uh, in front of us, full of sacrifices, certainly, but uh, that uh, if we have to took and and I can and after my my two years and a half of presidency, uh, I have to say that uh, I see that we have the 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 force now, so uh, I. I think that uh, if we want to become independent, uh, an independent country, we, 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 can, we can be an independent country. One of the most important poets in, in Catalonia, Josep Carné, once said that the, the popular will might be considered as the first Republican institution. And I totally agree with that. So it, it depends on uh, the popular will. Uh, as, as in every uh, independence movement. No, we, we are not doing something uh, rare or strange in, 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 in the world. Many other uh, countries uh, become independent, doing uh, the same that the Catalans. If there's a majority of Catalans that want to be independent, then we will be independent. But obviously, and I agree with you, uh, the only way for uh, achieving that is uh, using uh, this combination of determination for, uh, from the institutions, from the entities of the social, social, uh, civil social uh, organizations and the people of Catalonia. And with uh, only uh, one point uh, and one achievement that is the independence. And, and that, that means necessarily as the 14th of April and the 1st of October, uh, a great act of uh, massive disobedience and then defending this disobedience uh, 
peacefully but massively. I think that is the this this is this is the way. Thank you very much, President Torra. Uh, you were talking, and I'll, I'll quote you on that. Uh, we need institutions and, and civil society organizations uh, sort of working together, whole of society. So this uh, sort of helps me out here to, to post, um, to, to, to ask uh, another question to, to Professor Harrington here, because, uh, well, sort of, it, we've had uh, civil society talking, institutions or former institutions talking in the voice of President Torra. Uh, do you think that um, the uh, response or the behavior of uh, Sp the Spanish authorities, the Spanish regime, uh, will always be uh, predictable in, in this sense? Well, uh, do you think that if uh, Catalonia tries uh, with this uh, institution and civil society working together, if it tries to defend its rights of self-determination again, do you think that the Spanish uh, regime, society, organizations, uh, judiciary system, government, do you think that they will react in the same way? Do you think they'll be predictable in the future? I think in that sense, uh, we're living in a very interesting moment in history. In that, and I'm from an empire. I, I, I live in an empire and I, I, I've never since I became aware of that, we're not told that growing up, uh, if, but when you learn that you live in an empire, then you begin to look at it in the way that it, you begin to look at the way empires work. And Spain in some, a certain sense still continues to see itself in imperial terms. And one of the tragedies of empires is that empires are not very introspective. They are not entities that say, how could we do it better? How could we find better ways to work these problems out? They always go over an edge, if you will, at a point in history where they begin to become cruder and cruder in their, their exercise of power. I've watched it happen in the course of my lifetime in the United States, which isn't to say we haven't been an imperial power during my lifetime, but I've watched over the last 20 years how even the disguise, the cleverness that once used to mark our uh, attempts to control others has diminished. And we're now having someone like Secretary Pompeo go around the world saying, do this, don't do this, and if you don't, I'll punish you. And, and I think this is a certain thing that happens to countries that have long gotten used to ordering people around. And so I'm very pessimistic along with Joanna and President Torra about Spain's ability to, even in a time when it's its institutions are clearly in crisis. I'm very uh, pessimistic about its ability to create and talk a new game. So I, I very much affirm the idea that things have to come from the Catalans. I'm from an Irish background and the translation of Sinn Féin often is ourselves alone. And the idea that when the Irish were facing uh, the British Empire, there came a time where they had to say ourselves alone we're going to have to do this or we're not going to have to do this. And I think that's going to involve a couple of things that I think are both strong parts of the character of the Catalans and weak parts of the character of the Catalans. The idea of going from the defensive to the, from the accommodating to an offensive posture, uh, I think is difficult for Catalan society because of many historical reasons we could point to, the whole tradition of pactism, the whole tradition of mercantile of a, of a mercantile Mediterranean society, and the idea that you sometimes have to draw a line and simply say, this is how we're going to do it, is very difficult. But I think on top of that, there's another thing that we're remiss if in our time if we, we ignore, which is the importance of media. Uh, we're living in a time where media has gotten so powerful. And again, my country is very important in this realm uh, the, through the Atlantic Council and all sorts of other uh, organizations that they can now virtually create realities and convince large amounts of people of the ver veracity of those realities. And so the, the, the bigger question is you can have the willpower, but how do you wake up people that are being constantly um, bombarded by invented realities from very large powers that have an interest in uh, your not knowing truths about certain realities. I mean, just look at the mainstream 
uh, coverage of the Catalan movement. If you're not a reader of the Catalan press and you're reading the New York Times, who basically reads the Van La Vanguardia, who then passes it on to NPR in the United States. And so basically you have a, a, a view of the Catalan crisis that comes out of the chancelleries in Madrid as they talk to the New York Times correspondent, Rafael Minder, who then talks to someone at, at, at La Vanguardia and then talks to some, and someone back in the United States reads that and someone in Germany reads that because that's a prestige paper. And before you know it, the reality as, as, as put forth by the media complex in Madrid begins to multiply itself several times around the world. So that is an extremely large problem. Uh, one of the ways I think you can get around it, and I see it in my own children, is the decentralization of media and taking care of that. But there's still a lot of people who rely on the master narratives generated by big media companies. And I think we're living in a time where they're making one last stab to completely control. We're seeing censorship today through the big tech companies that is truly alarming on a number of issues that uh, so that's a, that's, a, that's a big problem. And these institutions are designed to sow doubt. And sadly, Catalans themselves are media consumers in this international media complex. And those doubts are foist upon many Catalans who, if they weren't consuming that media, might have a more intrinsic sense of their self-worth and their ability to confront the Spanish state. So these are very complex problems that I think a confrontation, which I believe in, must take into account. And there, there's going to need to be needing some real creativity, some real sacrifice. And I think sacrifice is another problem because we live in a consumer culture. And one of the paradoxes is the fact of the fact of Catalonia's life is that it has lived 30 very good economic years in relative terms. And we begin to ask people to sacrifice people think, well, do I want to sacrifice what I've just begun to achieve? Perhaps, tragically enough, that's going to be easier to ask for sacrifice as some of the fallout from what we're living in now leads young people, I think, certainly, to not feel trust in the society's ability to deliver them. And they may say, well, what have I got to lose? And maybe it's time for me, since I have nothing to lose, to begin going back to the things I really want and to reclaiming the dignity that I really want to reclaim. So a number, a number of factors there. But. Thank, thank, thank you very much, uh, Professor Harrington. I'll, I'll, uh, in, in a minute, I'll, I'll ask uh, Joanna whether uh, uh, you think if uh, Catalan society is uh, willing to sacrifice or not, but hold your thoughts for a bit now just because um, President Torra, he's, he's got a, a prior engagement, so he's going to have to leave us in, in about 10, 10 minutes, a bit more than 10 minutes. And as we've got quite a sizable audience today, and uh, we've had some, some very interesting questions coming in, uh, I would like, if you don't mind, President Torra, to, to get at least one question from our audience that I think it's very, it's very relevant if, uh, if you don't want to, to answer, which is, uh, related to President Compagnes. Uh, so before you leave us, uh, um, we got this, this, this question, uh, says, well, Spanish so-called, that uh, I'm quoting, uh, Spanish so-called leftist parties, uh, so parties currently in the government of Spain, uh, be PSOE, Podemos, they uh, refuse to apologize on behalf of the state, on behalf of the Spanish state, for Compagnes' assassination. Now, uh, the question goes as follows, President Torra, why do you think it is that difficult for them to make this step, to come, to come out and apologize in the name of the Spanish state? Yes, it's, it's, a, good, it's a very good question, you know, because, uh, well, obviously from, from the right parties, we, we used to know the answer, but uh, what is surprising to many people is what is happening with the left parties that uh, they act in the same way that uh, the right uh, parties here in Spain. And 
And well, uh, one of the lessons of, of the life and, and death of President Kumpanj is that uh, President Kumpanj wasn't an independentist. Uh, he was a federalist uh, in, 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 in the essence of the world federalism means. Yeah? But uh, well, he always tried uh, also, he proclaimed as well uh, the famous 6th of October of the year 1934. He proclaimed the, the Catalan Republic. But, but uh, I think that, uh, well, if you read uh, their thoughts and, and the papers and the speeches, uh, President Companys uh, was, let's say, what, what, what nowadays uh, you, you would say that uh, well, he, he, was, uh, he will be fighting for, uh, for, for federalism. In, in, in Spain, so, so, so he still thought that uh, there could be uh, an agreement between uh, the Catalans and, and the Spaniards. But, uh, uh, well, history shows us that, uh, well, even, even all that uh, combines uh, did for uh, this uh, understanding between Catala Catalonia and, and Spain, uh, you, we have to remember some, some examples. For instance, you know that the, the last day that the campaign was in, in Catalonia, that the day that, that he started uh, his exile, well, uh, he uh, accorded with uh, the president of the Spanish Republic to, to go together to, to the exile. And well, he uh, had to, to go alone with the past president because the, the, Spaniard, uh, the Spanish president uh, well, left them uh, just a few years ago. For instance, this, this was an example, but, but I think that this is an interesting example of what happened between Companys and, and the left parties in, 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 in his times. But uh, well, I, I wanted uh, as well to, to read uh, just a few a few words, a fragment of the last, uh, let's say, the political testament of President Compines that uh, he wrote himself uh, some hours before he, he was executed. And, and he's, he's, he said to all of us, to, to, to the Catalans people, the following sentence, to, uh, he said, I forgive all those who have aggravated me I apologize to all of those whom I might have aggravated. If I have to die, I will die peacefully. There is not a shadow of resentment left within me. I will thank God for letting me die in such a beautiful way for my ideals. He, what, he has wanted this destiny, his destiny, and I owe him the gratitude for the placidity and serenity that I feel when I think of death which I see approaching without fear. My smallness could not hope for a more digni dignified end for Catalonia and all that it represents of peace, justice, and love. Well, it remains, or it remembers uh, the, the famous words that another uh, famous Catalan, Pau Casals, uh, said to the world in the, in the United Nations, remembering this idea of, of peace this idea of justice, thus, that is, I think, uh, always in, in this idea of the Catalans for, 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 for their freedom. But, uh, well, uh, coming back to, to, the, to the point and to, and to the answer, uh, uh, there's a famous sentence from, from another famous writer in Catalonia, Josep Pla, that uh, he said that uh, there's nothing more uh, equal than uh, Spanish uh, that is defending the, the right position, that than the Spanish defending the left, uh, the left position. And uh, above all, I think that uh, the Spaniards uh, being uh, from uh, uh, the right or the left, well, they defend the same idea of Spain, unfortunately for us but they defend this unity of Spain that is uh, the first thing and, and is even um, the priority than, than justice and, and civil rights. Mm? This, this idea of unity, uh, this idea of 
integrity or territorial integrity of, of, of Spain. And I think that, that the times have changed and, and now uh, democracy is, uh, is, is the first thing that you have to take in consideration. It's something unbelievable nowadays to, to think that uh, it's possible to continue living together uh, in this way, uh, you know, uh, uh, forbidden the Catalans to decide their own future is something so simple at the end that, uh, well, it's even uh, stupid, I think, not let the Catalans decide their they future. And uh, I, I want to say that we, I, I will respect what the Catalans decide. If that's, that's what is important. Uh, or, or at least I, I, I put all the importance in the, in the, in the next uh, elections that uh, we will have in Catalonia next February. I think that uh, they have to be uh, key elections in the sense to, to give a mandate to the, to the new governments of Catalonia that uh, the way of the 1st of, the 1st of October is the way that we want to follow, yes or not. Clearly, so I, I, I want to uh, again, and, and I did it in, in an interview that I had in the in the in the TV in the Catalan TV last 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 week. I, I, I would like to to pre to press, if I can say this this word, or to put all the pressure in the parties to to really uh, know exactly what are they going to do with our votes. I think that it's important to be clear now. In Catalonia, and, and to say to, to to the Catalans, what are they going to do in the in the future? We'll we'll leave that question open to, to the parties who are not here today. But the, if you still have five extra minutes before uh, before you can leave us, yes. there's still great. Then then there's still just uh, uh, two questions in one that we just uh, received from from YouTube. For, and, 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 and they both uh, talk about the, the, the Spanish monarchy. And for, first one is, did you have the opportunity to talk, to actually talk to King uh, Felipe VI at some point during your, uh, your term, your presidency? And, and therefore, what role do you think, uh, what importance do you think the, the Spanish king and the Spanish monarchy plays in, in, in this idea of the unity of the Spanish uh, state and its own existence? Mm -hmm. First yes, question is very easy, it's a yes or no, yeah. and second is a bit more. <laughs> <laughs> okay, probably I think that, that uh, after uh, President Pujol, probably, uh, I, I, uh, probably I, I, I have been the, the president that I have in contact with uh, the King of Spain so many times. Uh, so I think that, uh, well, and, and each time has its own history, you know. Uh, the first time that uh, we met, uh, I gave him the book of Jordi Borras with uh, photos and images from the 1st of October, from the day of the referendum. Uh, and, and I said to him that uh, I thought that uh, the King of Spain should know and, and should uh, see uh, what happened at, uh, those days in Catalonia when the Spanish uh, police uh, attacked uh, peaceful uh, people that was voting. And well, uh, he said nothing. And uh, what well, was the, the first meeting we had? The second, the second encounter or the second meeting that, that we had was uh, in the Catalonia Square uh, because we were comm commemorating the, the attempts of the 17th of August. And that was the first anniversary. And well, he came to Barcelona and I received him with the wife of uh, Joaquim Forn, one of the political prisoners. And to the king and to the other members of the government of Spain, including the, the head of the judicial power, I uh, presented the wife of Joaquim Forn telling them that, uh, okay, this is the wife of one of the political prisoners that we still have in Catalonia. And I think that was important, this, this, this message as well, no? But, uh, 
And, and well, and after that, uh, we've met sometimes in the field of Barcelona and in some lunch that, well, uh, the, the talks between, between uh, he and, and me were uh, very few, very few, I, I, I can say that. I think that uh, what is important politically, uh, what is important uh, or the relevance politically is that, that Felipe VI, I, I think that that uh, he uh, understand his role uh, as uh, the symbol of this unity of Spain, uh, and, and and probably this is something that uh, he he was uh, he understood from 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 his uh, childhood, you know, because uh, remember that his father in the last days of Franco uh, Franco told told him, told to Juan Carlos, that his only concern was to maintain the unity of Spain. You know, this was, let's say, the message that Franco gave to Juan Carlos, his last message, uh, maintain the unity of Spain. And I think that this idea is part of uh, the Bourbon dynasty. This idea of unity of Spain is, is, is the first idea. And, and, and Felipe VI, really uh, not only represents that, he's uh, defending that uh, in, in all, all the ways you can imagine, even uh, giving a speech, the, the famous speech of the 3rd of October, uh, defending the, the police that attacked the, the people of Catalonia. Uh, so uh, I think that as a symbol, but always as, a, as a, an inductor, uh, uh, a leader of this idea of, of unity of Spain. Right. President Torra, um, it's, I think it's right on, on time, the time you told us uh, you had to leave. So we will not keep you here for... Thank you very much. It's, it's a pity not having more time. Thank you, Professor Harrington. Thank you, Joana Pujol. And thank you, Adria, for, for this time. And hopefully we will see another time. Really appreciate it. Thank you very much for Thank joining you very us much. today. Thank, Thank you very much. much. Uh, so uh, in the meantime, we, we will still continue eh, for, uh, for a couple more minutes with uh, Professor Harrington, Harrington and, uh, and Joana Pujol. Uh, actually, um, we, we, I, I asked you, uh, Joana, to, to hold your thought on, on something uh, before uh, uh, I started asking questions to President Torra before he left. I, I, uh, yeah, whether you think that the Catalan society is uh, ready for for a new sacrifice, ready to 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 start it over again, uh, to go at it again, as uh, Professor Harrington was saying, and, and and being aware of what it entails, of what of this repression, of this uh, predictable reaction of the Spanish state. Thank you, Lia. Well, um, to answer to your point, we need to assume that, as we said before as well, Spanish repression has achieved one of its more important goals, as we are, of course, not independent yet. And it has also managed to divide the pro-independence movement around alternative approaches to stand up against the repression and to fight against it. And this can be a bit risky, we can say, as distract us for our main goal. And I can give you an example here. Three years ago today, there was a unique claim, independence. After Spain jailed first the Jordis and then half of the government, we started calling for their release and some quarters started to demand an amnesty for getting the independence claim. So when Spain suspended the Catalan government and the parliament, the most regionalist blocks of the pro-independence movement, as we can call them, started to insist on the need to restore those institutions and again, forget the independence claim. So to the point that today, three years later, mostly very few defend the 1st of October mandate and the importance of keeping the independence at the top of the, of the agenda. So repression fulfilled its goals in that sense, However, it's also successfully proven that the movement has continued despite the repression. And we can see that we have become a more major political movement. And the Spanish regime put our representatives in jail 
yet the support for independence has not decreased at all, as we can see from the results of recent elections. So to go back to the question, um, the independence movement is a bottom-up movement, a grassroots, a grassroots movement, we can, we can say, and there is more of us than Rome in Spain jail, so we are going to carry on. So there are now forthcoming Catalan elections next February, and we need to understand it as an opportunity to overcome repression and reclaim the initiative. So our roadmap in the Catalan National Assembly is quite simple. If most voters support independence, democracy should prevail and the Catalan parliament should proclaim independence and this time defend it and call for international recognition. And that's it. Thank you. Yeah, almost nothing, I w one would say. Eh? Almost nothing. You said it's simple. <laughs> uh, uh, Professor Harrington, I have not forgotten about you. Uh, no, no. We, we also received a couple of questions for you. Uh, at least I would try and pass one and read one uh, for you. This is a, this is a classic question. I'm, I'm, I'm sure you've been uh, asked this a lot about. Uh, I, I, I know that currently the, the, the U.S. public opinion is very much focused on 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 on, on, on an election coming <laughs> coming up in November the third. Uh, but obviously. Um, I, I guess that that might be some someone from Catalonia asking you, uh, how would you describe the the state of U.S. public opinion on the Catalan case and on 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 self determination issues around the world, uh, and and whether and and, and obviously uh, here whether you have some some sort of uh, recommendation advice that you can give the, the Catalan pro-independence movement. You, you, you can talk here to, to Joana Pujol, what, what advice would you give her? And what advice would you give to, to the movement as a whole? You, you, you sort of started talking about the uh, sort of attitudes that we should be taking, but in terms, or in terms of, of uh, perhaps communication, in terms of what values should, should, should the Catalan movement be trying to, to put out there in order to try and, 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 and work its ways with the uh, with the U.S. Uh, public opinion. Wow, that's a that's a very hard question because uh, one of the sorry things sorry that, to ask you that it, now it's, one of the it's things the papers it's not me. <laughs> one of the things that's happened in the United States, and I'm going to give it a period of 30 years, has been a conscious and somewhat uh, and not always conscious, but oftentimes conscious attempt by the powers that be working hand in hand with an increasingly corporatized media to shut us off from knowledge of the world. Uh, we have become an increasingly, pardon the term, autistic country when it comes to our view of the world over the last 30 years. Part of that has to do with the crisis in newspapers in the United States. Most newspapers, the, the serious and important ones used to have correspondence all around the world. Now they don't any longer. And they used to have people who would work a beat and be in that place for years, would speak the language in many cases, which was odd for an American, but at least would know the ground where they were. The, the rollback in newspaper revenues has cut down on all of that. And it's coincided with an effort starting in the Reagan administration to make Americans focus ever more on themselves and less on the world. And the, the obvious goal in this was to make us less sympathetic for the world because there used to be something they would talk about in the State Department. The Reagan people used to say, he went native or she went native. That is, they got to know the country they are in too well where they began to have a sympathy for it. And so there's been an entire movement to try and make us not go native, not find sympathy for other people. And that makes it extremely difficult for foreign powers, unless they have a whole lot of money that they can use to buy influence. And I'm sure some of you are aware of some of the famous lobbies we have in the United States, probably most notably the Saudi lobby and the Israeli lobby, which can literally buy influence in the United States. And so it's gotten to be a movement, um, there's gotten to be a situation where if you can't buy that, it is extremely hard for you to get your message out. And again, I think the media model is changing. 
I think the media model is more decentralized, and I think it's going to depend a lot on how uh, we can begin to reach people who are under 50, who have different media consumption. Professor Harrington, we just lost you there for a couple seconds again. Uh, and if we can hear you. How about now? Uh, yeah, nope. there you are. Oh, it's third time, but it's it's fine. You know, we are hearing you loud and clear again. Yeah or no? Um, I think we just lost Professor Harrington there. Oh, so, uh, these men is about the world works. Okay. Oh, there, there you are. There you are. There you are again. Okay. All right. Yes. But yes. if you'll if you'll allow me, I'd like to just go back to one thing that Professor uh, that. President Tora spoke mm -hmm. about, and I think it applies to both states, Catalonia and Spain for that matter. The increasing uselessness of the left-right paradigm in looking at problems. As much as Trump is undesirable as a human being, Biden, if he wins, is not going to do anything to change the American empire and its reach in the world. So there's a left-right divide, but in fact, there's an implicit understanding between both parties that certain things can't be changed. And I think insofar as the left-right paradigm or Catalan activists allow the left-right paradigm to define the way they look at the problem of self-determination, they're hurting themselves. I really don't think the left-right paradigm is very helpful at all. And I think to, to compare the Catalan so-called right, the Spanish right, as is often done by people on the Catalan left or the uh, Spanish left Catalonia, very helpful. They are very different animals and to exaggerate the difference between the Catalan left and right, I think is a strategic mistake. Uh, so as, as, as we sort of lost you uh, for, for a second, let, let me just uh, go back to what you said so that our uh, audience perhaps can, can, can also understand your, your very last point. I, I believe you were, you were, you were explaining that uh, you, uh, it doesn't make much sense to compare the Catalan right to the Spanish right or the Catalan, the Catalan left to the Spanish right uh, to, the, to the Spanish left. Uh, so that the, the, the left, this left-right paradigm uh, of looking at the world, uh, the world uh, into and seeing it into like two different worlds that are perfectly aligned uh, between nations, that, that doesn't really work when talking about Catalonia and Spain. Huh? Um, correct me if I, <laughs> if I just rephrase More or, less. You, or if I just More or less, yes. made up what you said. But um, I think that was your 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 point, uh, and 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 just let, let, let us see, yeah, just to 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 come to an end, uh, and and let's see if we can hear you a bit better this time. We'll just tempt luck once again uh, and try and get a, a, a very last answer from 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 you, uh, Professor Harrington. Uh, you 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 sort of partially answered the question, huh? but. Um, basically, the, the one last question that we got a couple of minutes ago on, on YouTube is, uh, it's basically whether uh, as Catalan pro-independent supporters, should we be siding with Biden or with Trump? Uh, and, and being it, uh, expanding a little bit on it, uh, whether you think that the, that the, that, that whether if, if, if the situation sort of heats up in Catalonia again, as, as, as as Joanna was saying, that perhaps after the election, there, there could be some some uh, some going back at uh, at, uh, at 2017. Um, whether you think that uh, well, Vice President Joe Biden or President Trump uh, would handle it somehow differently, or you just think there's there's no difference? Um, I'm going to give you an answer that might surprise a lot of people and. Don't read anything into it about my own political sympathies. Um, but strangely enough, if you have to choose between the two in terms of who is more likely 
to be supportive of the Catalan case, it's going to be the Trump side. And, and, and the reason for that, and this is what you see when you see, when you gauge interest in the Catalan case in America, really the only center of the political, the only part of the political spectrum that has demonstrated any sustained interest in the Catalan case are the libertarians of the right. The, what, what we call right libertarians who believe in small government, who believe in devolution of power, who believe in small community uh, government. And they're an important part of the Trump vote, an increasingly important part of the Trump vote. And so you may be looking at strange bedfellows uh, as you go down the road, because if anything, the Biden are very much more sold on the NATO view of the world, uh, shoring, up, um, shoring up the EU along NATO lines, whereas Trump, at least rhetorically, opens the door to the idea of individual cultures and nations having more power. Now that we see the negative side of that and sometimes we, people read it into, well, he's for Putin, he's for the Hungarian people, he's for, but there's also part of that that transfers, strangely enough, uh, to the Catalan case where there might be more opening uh, with, a, with a Trump victory than with, um, than with a Biden one. Having said that, I don't think it's very high on the radar. It's one of the things I always have to tell my Catalan friends. Most people in America, for various reasons, don't know where Catalonia is. Uh, they need to be schooled rather quickly, and most of them still have trouble understanding it. Uh, so it, it's not a concern, uh, sadly, of most people in the United States. All right, that, that, that was sort of an unexpected answer. But, uh, <laughs> but still, I, I appreciate, <laughs> I appreciate your, your honesty there. And, and I also appreciate that, uh, uh, that yeah, you, you, uh, you were very clear on, on the fact that, yeah, I mean, Catalonia is not on American agenda. So basically, it's a, we have a bit of a blank page to, to fill, perhaps, there. You know? yeah. Yes, that's so, the optimistic reading. <laughs> well, we, we, do, we have to finish on a, on a high note, don't we? As a, otherwise, otherwise uh, people will be thinking that we organize this just in order to make people think that people have to, to vote for Trump or something. Uh, but um, <laughs> in any case, in any case, now, but uh, be, besides no, the no, jokes aside, no. <laughs> jokes, jokes aside, Professor Harrington, uh, Harrington I, I, I really want to uh, thank you very much for your, for your kindness and your honesty with your, with your answers. And I think they provide a useful insight for, for uh, for Catalans and and and, and also for uh, any any pro democracy pro self determination movement out there that that is trying to to well gain some traction and and, mm -hmm. and try and make history right uh, so uh, again I just want to say again if you wanna if you wanna know more about uh, Professor Harrington's uh, uh, view of uh, Spanish and Catalan history uh, don't hesitate to buy his book, especially if you can buy it from the assemblea.cat um, website, uh, which would be a great idea, especially for us, in order to be able to make uh, more of these um, great events and these uh, great panels. And I, and I surely hope to see you again, Professor Harrington, very soon, perhaps in another, in another panel. I'd be delighted. And, and also thank you very much, uh, Joana, Joana Pujol, for, for joining us. From from London, even though it's a bit, it is a bit earlier than than in Barcelona. But uh, you told me before that you are feeling very very sick today. So uh, I think it's it is fair that our uh, people who are viewing this also know that you uh, made the effort to to join us today, uh, even though you were feeling very sick. I hope it's nothing. It's, I hope it's nothing. I hope it's just you know, you're being tired of working a lot and working a lot for Catalan independence in the in the UK. Uh, so uh, also thank you very much and hope that we can have you with us uh, again very soon. Thank you. Thank you, Adrian, for organizing this event today.
And Thank you very much, Andrea. well, it wasn't it wasn't just me. Eh? It wasn't just me. Definitely, it, it was. Uh, there, we've got a, a fantastic team back here in Barcelona for the Catalan National Assembly. Uh, we we I, and, and I wish to to thank you all who are watching, who have been watching us for this hour and twenty minutes, uh, pretty much. And uh, for all the questions we've got, we've had, uh, we we could only get uh, four of them. But uh, we'll be we'll be sure to make them to make them reach their 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 expected uh, audience. And uh, thank you very much for staying with us. Thank you very much for tuning in with us. Uh, for those who have been watching us live, and for those who perhaps are watching us in the near future or in the far future, when perhaps Catalonia is already an independent republic. So thank you very much, and hope to see you again. And. Uh, also, thank you very much again, Professor Harrington, Joanna Pujol, and all of the team here at Assemblea. Thank you very much. Thanks very much.